Welcome to this video analysis of Holborn's Pavan and Galliard. This first video is just on the Pavan. We'll start off with context. Anthony Holborn, born in 1504, died in 1602. He is an English composer, and he wrote mainly consort music. This means music for small instrumental ensembles. He composed in the time of Queen Elizabeth I and was held in very high regard by his contemporaries such as Dowland and Byrd. The Pavan, Galliards, Alamans, and other short airs, both grave and light, in five parts, four viols, violins, recorders, and other musical instruments. Well, that was the title of the work. Uh, these uh, pieces are found in that work of Pavan, Galliards, Alamans. And the Pavan and Galliards were paired together. Now, what's really interesting about this title is the five parts, because when we get into texture, you will see that it is for five part polyphony. And also, you'll see that the word violin is in there, an instrument that was very rare back then, but must have been around in the family homes of the time, starting to creep into music making, obviously coming in from Italy, because viols were still king of the string instruments. The most pieces in the collection are of the pavan galliard combination, and Interesting, Holborn just didn't write Pavan and Galliards. He wrote a thing called the Fairy Round, which is part of the Voyager spacecraft golden record. The Voyager spacecraft is now the first spacecraft to recently leave our solar system and is the first spacecraft to be in deep space. And one day, if aliens come along and find this spacecraft drifting in outer space, they'll take the golden record that is attached inside and they'll be playing it. And one of the tracks of music is Holborn's Fairy Round, and it sounds like this. <laughs> rather interesting piece to find if you're an alien from another planet or galaxy or wherever to bump upon Holborn's fairy round. Forces and resources. First of all, Holborn stipulates on the title page that the collection of these pieces is in two movements and were intended for what is called an unbroken or whole ensemble. Whole ensembles would have been either all recorders or all viols. If they were mixed, they would have been called a broken ensemble. And because it was for family music making, the musicians performing these pieces would have been amateur musicians, not professionals. Although in the King's Courts, they certainly would have been performed as well, and they would have been performed by professional musicians. And mention of the violin, as I said before, was very rare, but they must have been around in family homes. So what is it a recorder concert sort? Well, it consists of oboes, cornets, and sax butts. A viol, and that's what they look like, by the way. You can see in the picture, um, it looks almost, those two on the left look almost like the modern day bassoon, and were reed instruments, actually. And then they get smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to the size of what we're used to today in recorders. A viol consort would consist of uh, what they call a paradisus, which is a high treble, a treble viol, an alto viol, a small tenor, a tenor viol, and a bass, and a violon. 
Now, Bach used the violon. Oh, actually, a lot of Baroque composers used the violon. That was the lowest bass instrument of the time. Um, he used, Bach used the violon, actually, in his Brandenburg concertos, uh, at least some of them. And that would be a viol consort. And that is what a viol consort would look like, a uh, painting of the time. And you can see the different sizes. Now, what's interesting about a viol consort is that they're either played on the ground or between the knees. None of the viols are played under the chin, like the violin family today. Also, it is worth noting that um, these people, when they're making music, the, the, viol the viols are very flat. They're not convex. They're just flat boxes. And that was what gives them their very, very mellow sound. Um, Holborn's works uh, are scored for five instruments, and if played by viols, they would need two trebles, one tenor, and two basses. And this piece, the Pavan and Galliard, they sound better on viols than they would on recorders. So most likely, it would have been uh, played on viols. And we'll get into why it sounds better later on in this video analysis. Form and structure. Now, the Pavan has a very interesting form and structure. It has three sections. And I've delineated them by putting them as A, B, and C. Um, the sections are also marked by repeats. It's quite simple to see where each section starts and stops. What you will notice on here, which is really quite interesting, because we're used to everything being of equal value in section-wise or making some sort of sense balance-wise in our music, you'll find that in here we have unbalanced sections. The first strain, the A section, is 16 bars. The second strain, the B section, is 17 bars. And the third strain, the C section, is 26 bars. Now we're going to listen to this piece, as we will several times in this uh, video analysis, uh, to internalize it, and we're going to internalize the form and structure. I want you to listen to it and see if any themes come back at all within, uh, from section to section, so tying in maybe a ternary form if possible, who knows? And also, note what happens when each section repeats.
So, did you notice, on the repeats of each section, or strain, the melody, and a lot of the accompaniment too, was embellished. A lot of ornamentation put in that is not written there. This was common practice of the time, so that the repeats didn't sound exactly the same. Did you notice any material returning? No, there wasn't any material returning, and um, therefore it's first strain, second strain, third strain, A, B, C. So, what do we call this form and structure? Well, form and structure of this pavan, A, A, B, B, C, C, is called strain form. And each section is of a different length. This means that the sections are not balanced but irregular. And this shows that the pavan was not meant as a dance, as a pavan is, but as something more intimate in nature. And I think we can all agree, listening to that, that is definitely not danceable. That is very much listening music and very intimate listening music indeed. Also, another indication that this is not music for dance is the dense counterpoint, the five-part counterpoint, which we will get into later when it comes to texture. This signifies that it is music to be listened to. Okay, so strain form. And we had our first strain um, of uh, 16 bars, the second strain of 17 bars, and then a very much longer third strain. So you get the idea throughout time in this piece, this piece is very, you know, this music of the Renaissance is very linear, that things get longer and longer and longer. And that's the way music was back then. It wasn't as balanced as we think of it today. So this is strain form somewhat through composed, but you call it strain form, and the idea that each section is longer than the next. Let's look at tonality. First of all, we'll put back on all our sections from form and structure. Now, tonality is proven as to what key each section is, starts in and ends in, and whether there are common cadences that end the section. Well, if we look at the A section, okay, the first strain, it starts in D major, it travels to A major, and then it goes to G major rather quickly, kind of like a passing modulation, back to A major, finally to D major. So it's going from the tonic to the dominant to the subdominant, back to the dominant, back to the tonic. I'm putting in colors now to show how long each key lasts. And as you can see, coming to the end of the strain, or the A section, it picks up speed on where the key center is going. But it's very settled in the beginning. Now, the B section starts in G major. So he doesn't modulate from the A to the B section. It jumps from the tonic to the subdominant. And it travels to D major, to A minor, to A major, to E minor, to D major, A major, finally ending on A major. So once again, I'm putting in the colors so you can see how long each key lasts for. And what you'll notice is this uh, section starts in one key and ends in another, G major, and ends in A major, unlike the A section, which is D major, and ends in D major. As you can see in the B section, the tonality shifts much faster and much more often than it does in the A section. The first strain is much more settled tonality-wise than the B section. Finally, in the C section, we start in D major, and we travel to G major, and we go to A major, and back to D major, a little bit of A major, back to D major. This is just tonic to subdominant to dominant to tonic to dominant to do tonic. Very settled, like the first strain. And once again, putting in colors, you can see that what happens here is it gets active before the final cadence. But it is very settled throughout in D major. So the B section is where all the tension happens with tonality. Travels through many keys 
and um, starts in one key, ends in another. The first strain and third strain, the A and C section, start in D major, end in D major, and just deal with the subdominant and dominant keys. So they're very settled in their way when it comes to tonality. We also notice that the A section, the, the first strain, ends with a perfect cadence, and the B section also ends with a perfect cadence. And so does the C section end with a perfect cadence. So this is basically in D major. Um, it um, has somewhat modal inflections in it, but it's very much in a D major uh, diatonic um, scale is used throughout and um, travels through subdominant and dominant keys mainly, except the B section gets a bit more exploring in that aspect. A major, G major, back to A major, resolving to D major. You could hear in there how the uh, tonality traveled from tonic, subdominant, and dominant. You can listen to it again and go through the other sections and hear the same thing. Let's move on to context, forces, and resources, and tonality review. Now what you're going to hear on this little quiz that's coming up is some more extended listening. And it's a pavan by a gentleman called Alfonso uh, Farabosco II. I know nothing about him, might be worth looking up, but this could come up on your exam in the extended listening part. So. Pavan by Alfonso Ferrabosco II with some review questions for you to answer on the Holborn Pavan. Harmony. I have analyzed the first uh, section, the first strain, the A section of this piece uh, harmonically, and we can look at it and you see 
a lot of primary chords being used, one, four, and five. There is a two chord thrown in there, I think, for good measure, basically. But, and you will notice that these primary chords are mainly, not all the time, but mainly in root position. Yes, he uses first and second inversions, and he also has a lot of suspensions, which we'll get to in a moment. But mainly primary chords in root position. If you were to analyze the second strain, the B section, and the third strain, the C section, I would believe you would find pretty much the same thing. Holborn also uses pedal tones. Now we got two types of pedal tones. We have tonic pedal tones, which is on the tonic of uh, degree of the scale being used, and we also have what's called a dominant pedal tone. Holborn uses these pedal tones, the tonic pedal tone at the beginning of the third strain, and the dominant pedal tone at the end of the third strain. Pedal tones being used in the third strain have a bit of significance because it brings finality to the piece. And um, in this instance, it really does work. And the dominant pedal also doubles as what we would call an extended perfect cadence. It helps that extended perfect cadence come along, which brings true finality to the end. So um, quite an interesting harmonic device, which a couple hundred years later, uh, Beethoven uses to great extent in all his works, but that is a subject for another time. But tonic pedal tones and dominant pedal tones, and the dominant pedal tone forming a large part of an extended perfect cadence at the end. These pedal tones bringing finality to the piece, that is why he uses them only in the third section or the third strain or C section. Holborn uses another harmonic device called suspensions. Now suspensions are really interesting because they got parts to it. They got uh, three basic parts, preparation, suspension, and resolution. And we can see a suspension here right there in bar three and four. It's the tied note over, the D tied over. That is the suspension. And what happens, you got your preparation note. The preparation note is the note that is going to be tied over. It fits the chord. It is a chord tone. The suspension, it's that chord tone tied over into the next chord. It does not fit the chord. It becomes a suspension on the tie. And then you have the resolution to a note that is a chord tone of the note uh, of the chord of that bar. Now Holborn also uses melodic decoration and you can see the two quavers, the C sharp and the B, those are his melodic decoration. So Holborn goes preparation, suspension, decoration, resolution. You can find in the A section loads and loads of suspensions, tons of them. One, two, three, four, five, six suspensions in the A section. Now this is worth noting because this is a characteristic of the A section. The B section only has two suspensions. And the C section, I don't believe has any. You might be able to find one or two. But they, the point being is that they don't have anywhere near the suspensions that the A section has. The A section features suspensions. Why? Because it's linear music. Also, suspensions give you that feel of anticipation and the loss of a certain pulse. It keeps things nice and dreamy-like. And that is sort of what happens in that A section. Now, just because notes are tied over, if you look at bar two and three, that does not mean they're suspension. That tone fits both chords. The, one, the, the tonic chord and the dominant chord. It's the dominant note of the key we're in, and it fits both um, chords. So that is not a suspension. Do not think every tied note is a suspension. Not the case at all. Now, Holborn uses kind of a neat device called false relations. And if you look at the second system down and the purple stars, what happens here is you have a C sharp and then a C natural in another voice a beat or two later. That is called a false relation, and that causes things to sound a bit modal and a bit uneasy. Interesting, look at where these false relations, here's a couple more, where these false relations happen. In the A section, they happen 
right when the tonality is shifting, and right where you are going into a new key. So quite interesting there. In the B section, they happen also where the tonality is shifting, if you look there. And in the C section, it happens right at the end, during the extended perfect cadence, right at the beginning of the pedal tone, um, the uh, dominant pedal tone. So you can see Holborn uses false relations in very strategic places. They're not just put there by happenstance. Okay, we're going to listen to a recording soon of just the first section, and I will once again say the chords that are coming up so you can possibly hear them. We're not going to go through the whole piece, and hopefully hear the false relations as well, and the suspensions. <laughs> Dominant, back to tonic with the suspension, another suspension on the dominant. Suspension going over to A major, false relation, G major, false relation, A major to D major with the suspension. Melody. I've dropped. A lot happens with melody. I've put in the phrase lengths right now, and we're going to see that whether this is balanced or unbalanced. In the first strain, you can see there are two four bar phrases and an eight bar phrase. We could say that is somewhat balanced. The B section, a four bar phrase, a six and a half bar phrase, and a six and a half bar phrase somewhat balanced, but not really. And then the C section, the third strain, an eight bar phrase, an eight bar phrase, and a nine and a half bar phrase. Somewhat balanced, but not really. So we gotta really classify this as unbalanced phrasing. And that made uh, the piece uh, more reliable on its linear movement than up and down movement because sections are not delineated uh, by nice phrasing of cadences and it's very linear moving, and it creates a bit of dreaminess and want the piece always moving forward in time, not sectionalized like we're used to today. So, the melody is very conjunct in motion. If we listen to the melody, It's built completely on stepwise motion, very scalic. Um, it's very conjunct throughout with very few leaps. The melodic leaps, when they do happen, they are usually fourths and fifths, and they resolve or on octaves, and they resolve downwards or upwards by a step. But we have an interesting one. If you look at the one that I highlighted in yellow in the second system, you will see. We got a leap here. We have a leap of a third downwards that is then resolving upwards. That is called a cambiata, and the cambiata note is the note that leads to resolution. Another cambiata can be found in the um, second strain near the end uh, by the perfect cadence, and it's a cambiata variation actually, but the same principle does apply. Now, um, so melodic leaps, uh, we have cambiatas, 
And if you look in the third system on the second strain, you'll see there is a leap of a fourth there, but it resolves down by um, stepwise motion. So leaps are taken care of in that way. So they're very far and few between. Um, you might find a few into the um, uh, third strain. I can see one right now in the one, two, three, fourth, and fifth bar in, in the middle voice, there happens to be a leap. But these leaps are very far and few between. It's mainly conjunct motion, very few melodic leaps. But the leaps happen for a reason. Look at where those cambiatas happen, right before the final perfect cadence. So Holborn doesn't use these devices just any way he wants. There are reasons and purposes for these melodic devices being used. Now, we have a thing here called melodic imitation. And the melody, this motif, is a falling fourth. A very, very important melodic feature. A falling fourth in the Renaissance period was said to emulate sadness or crying, longing, that sort of thing. So it fits the title, the image of melancholy very weeping-like, and it comes into the uh, first bass, and it comes into the third voice again at the same pitch. So we got a lot of melodic imitation happening in this piece. We also have a thing called melodic inversion. Melodic inversion is simply the melody in a mirror image, and that happens in um, the second bass in the first system, you'll see. Now the rhythm is different than the original melodic motif, but it is a rising fourth. And so that is a melodic inversion. Happens also in the first bass. And in the um, uh, viol part, same pitches, and it goes up there. So we got a lot of melodic inversions happening. Now, if you look at the second strain, we've got a really neat thing happening here. We have in the first voice, we still got that fourth descending, and in the middle voice, we have it going upwards. And so what we have here is okay, and that is really quite an interesting uh, type of uh, thing that's happened because you know it's that's what I should have played. I played the wrong notes. I transposed wrong. So you got the ascending fourth against the descending fourth there. So melodic inversion is used throughout. Um, it's interesting where he uses it. Um, he uses it at the beginning of sections. You can see another place in the uh, third strain C section, right at the beginning of sections, he uses melodic inversion to set up those sections. Why does he use melodic inversion in the A section? He uses that in the middle because it's pushing that A section forward. The initial statement or motif is, is announced and then the melodic inversions push it forward. But then the next sections, he starts with melodic inversions. Uh, it kind of keeps the piece nice and fresh and uh, not repeating, which is, not, which is what they didn't want to have happen in the Renaissance period. So another melodic device is the mel melody is shared. Uh, that's proven throughout with all these purple and uh, um, uh, skin-colored marks on the score that you have um, shared melody throughout this piece. The first treble plays mostly melody throughout, although it's shared in other places, but the uh, melody is mainly carried in the first treble part. Now this is interesting because this is a lot like vocal writing, all right? 
and we'll get to that right now. Leaps are no more than a fifth, sometimes in an octave, which is very uh, much the way you'd write for voices, and very vocal character writing. Also, vocal character writing is your top voice would have the melody most of the time. Now, why are they writing melody um, for instruments like a, a voice? Because instruments were not written for, at that time, for their own strengths. They were written to imitate the human voice. It wasn't until the Baroque period that we have instrumental music written for the instrumental strengths, not for to imitate uh, a human voice. So that's the way composers compose for instruments then. And that's why there are leaps of no more than a fifth or an octave, uh, because uh, the voice can handle those sorts of leaps quite easily, a lot of stepwise motion, and the top voice gets the melody. The bass part leaps more than other parts, though, and that's very Baroque-style writing, um, even though it's Renaissance period. This is uh, what the Baroque masters copied, was that style that the bass leaped about. So that's an interesting characteristic in melodic writing here, is that the fifth voice, the bass, is the one that leaps about. It has shared melody on occasion, as can be seen in the first strain, but there are a lot of leaps in this part. If I play the bass part, leap, scalic, leap, leap, Uh, a series of leaps happen at the end, driving towards that final cadence. The melodic range is very, very narrow. Uh, you know, they're constricted to like an octave, uh, maybe a ninth, I think, at the most, in most of the voices, and this is uh, vo vocal writing as well. You don't have extreme ranges. It's all very compact and within a specific range. First motif, imitation. First phrase done, second phrase starting. Bass line moving in inversion. coming up. Cambiata. Resolution on the final cadence. Texture. With the texture, we can see plainly that it is five-part polyphony with imitation. There's no other type of texture in here. There's not antiphony, homophony, nothing like that at all. Simply five-part polyphony with imitation. There is little crossing of parts. This means parts do not go above and below each other, and that is very good vocal writing. Hence, going back to that they wrote for instruments as they were writing for voices, not for the instrumental strengths. So we can see two parts where there is indeed overlapping of voices. But that is the only two parts in the whole piece that overlapping of writing happens. So very little crossing of parts, um, you know, is written very much in a vocal style. And when those overlaps happen, it's very brief. It's only for like a bar or two. So texture was easy. What about rhythm and meter? Rhythm and meter is pretty easy as well. What happens here is the pavan is in duple time. This is the expected time sign for a pavan. A pavan dance was in duple time. The top four voices mainly move in crotchets, minims, and dotted minims. Did you ever notice that? Mainly, not all the time, but mainly crotchets, minims, and dotted minims. Only the tenor and first bass part play dotted crotchet quaver rhythms. Check it out. 
It's what happens. Very interesting how that's planned. And the second bass part mainly moves in minims and longer notes. Um, you know, it has the occasional crotchet in that, but it's mainly minims and longer notes. And finally, rhythmic ideas rarely repeated bar to bar. In other words, you have that melodic rhythm, but it doesn't come back in that voice for a very long time. And that is a practice of it, that, uh, of this style of music, is that rhythms are not repeated. So you get more of a linear feel once again to the music rather than, you know, that assured sectional delineation that we like concerning with rhythms, that rhythms repeat and come back uh, uh, the same again and again. Wasn't the case in this style at all. So, performance directions. This is dead easy, folks. None. Simple as that. None at all. It was common practice that instrumentalists knew what to do, uh, such as ornamenting on repeats, when the play soft, when the play loud, uh, so on and so forth. None. So, hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope that you continue to study this uh, Pavan. There's loads and loads of stuff in this little piece. But before we go, let's have a little revision review of harmony, melody, texture, rhythm, and meter. As you can see through all the musical elements, harmony and melody really, really make this piece move forward. And that is where the big concentration of things are. Harmony, melody, texture, rhythm, and meter. Let's have a review. And whilst you're reviewing, you will notice there's a piece playing in the background, and it is a, a pavan uh, for six viols in G minor by William Byrd. Some more extended listening. It might pop up on that exam. You never know. <laughs>